Welcome back uh, to campus. Uh, this is our first lecture for uh, CSCI 320, uh, namely operating systems. I'm Dr. Uh, Holness, and I will be your instructor uh, for the next 15 weeks over the course of the semester. And so you might be asking, why do we study operating systems at all? I mean, you know, some of you might never uh, program or tinker with the internals of an operating system. And that's a very good question. Why study them at all? Well, certainly because you want to get things done. And traditionally, for compute platforms, uh, you often think of things like maybe tablets, like we have up above. Maybe a compute platform, uh, you think of that as being a laptop or a desktop. Or for some of you, uh, you think of servers. Uh, when you think of uh, compute platforms. Certainly cloud-based services have become immensely popular over the past uh, decade. Now certainly each of these platforms allows you to get things done and each of them has an operating system and certainly the operating system that runs on a tablet functions very differently from the operating system that runs on a server instance in a cloud computing system. And so the whole idea is to get things done, but how you get things done and understanding that interface uh, that allows your program, your application program, to use the services of the underlying hardware, understanding how that happens, i.e. what the operating system does, will help you to write better applications to make good use or appropriate use of the underlying resources on your compute platform. If you make a poor decision for your application, well, then you're going to have poor performance. And of course, nobody says, hey, my application is running slowly because it's poorly written for the operating system on my tablet. People just say, I don't like this application. It's too slow. So the stakes are very high, so to speak. Uh, and so it's important to study operating systems so that you can better write applications by giving you insight into the functioning uh, and design considerations of the underlying operating system. And so these are other platforms um, that are non-intuitive. Uh, they are compute platforms. Now certainly some have a lot of sophisticated sensors uh, like this robot up top, or maybe here's a Roomba uh, vacuum, and that room, Roomba uh, uh, by iRobot is basically a computer with some sensors and specialized motors or actuators attached, and it implements the ability to autonomously uh, vacuum uh, your living space. Now, if we think of something maybe like uh, a smart meter, this is a power meter, right, from a smart grid, that's running an operating system, and it allows the power company, applications on that device, allows the power company uh, to read remotely your power consumption, and can do that over a number of homes over entire cities, and it can also regulate your power so to try to balance out the amount of energy available to prevent uh, brownouts. Here we have an artificial heart. Now this artificial heart, it too, uh, is a bunch of hardware with sophisticated pumps, and it too is running an operating system. Granted, it's highly specialized from what you would see, say, on a tablet or a phone, but it too is running an operating system. And we have everything from this exoskeleton to all sorts of specialized devices. And yes, these devices, quote unquote, get things done. And in order to get things done, there are applications running on them. And the operating system shares the resources or presents the resources of the underlying hardware to the applications so that they can get things done. And so certain applications have requirements that they impose on the underlying compute resources. They might need certain amount of memory or they might need a certain amount of computational ability, MIPS or million instructions per second, or they might need certain types of devices. And this will require you to understand operating systems because if you have an application with certain resource needs, well, you need to understand what resources are being made available. And those resources, those hardware resources, are made available by the underlying operating system. For example, some applications are so-called compute bound, meaning that they make a lot of numerical computations and therefore use a lot of uh, compu 
computational power, processing power on your CPU. Others use a lot of input and output. Maybe they send a lot of data off the computer or take a lot of data onto the computer across some kind of network. Now, those latter types, they're called I.O. bound uh, computations. And then you have some applications uh, that are mixed. They both traffic in data inbound and outbound, as well as make a lot of usage of the CPU. Now, of course, why do you characterize your application's resource needs? Well, because it's a fundamental tool, this operating system, for inventing the future. If you don't understand the resource capabilities of the underlying hardware made available through the operating system, how can you enable new applications? So, for example, to drive an autonomous driving scenario, right, you're going to have a lot of real-time data streaming in. That means as it happens. So, of course, you're going to need very fast I.O. because you're getting data all the time from all sorts of sensors. So, whatever underlying operating system you're running and the underlying hardware, it has to be able to handle a lot of inbound data, right? That's very different from something like your cell phone. Right? Uh, maybe you're running some applications, maybe occasionally you might watch a few YouTube videos or what have you, uh, but it's a very different quality to the data uh, associated with an autonomous driving scenario. Now for the autonomous driving scenario, not only do you have data inbound, but you have to make a decision as the data comes in. So if your car senses that the vehicle in front of it has stopped, well, right away, you want to apply the brakes if you have autonomous braking, which a lot of vehicles do now these days, a lot of the newer ones. So it's really, really important to understand the underlying system because ultimately when you write an application, you want to make sure that the resource requirements of the application it can be met by the underlying operating system. Otherwise, you have a catastrophic failure. So let's take a look before we hop into this uh, some of the administrative bits uh, for the course. And so the textbook uh, is required, uh, Silver, Schatz, and Galvin, and Gange uh, textbook, Operating Systems Concepts. Make sure you have the 10th edition. Uh, it was released in 2018, so it's still relatively recent, but it's a big one, a whopping 1,200 pages. And so it's only available in electronic format, um, EPUB format primarily. Um, there's the link to Wiley. Uh, which will point you to uh, the EPUB. You can buy the permanent one. Uh, you can buy it for, I think it's 120 days or 150 days at different price points. Okay, and so the reading uh, due by the 3rd of September, that should be 2020, that's a typo, not 2019. Um, the reading in Operating Systems Concepts uh, is Section 1.1 to Section 1.11, which are pages 3 uh, through 51. So it's not a lot of reading, but it's really, really important uh, for you to get this done, uh, do a little bit every night. Uh, homework number one has been released on the course Blackboard site. Uh, please look at that right away. It's going to be due September 1st uh, at the usual 11.59 and 59 seconds. So that's one second before midnight. Uh, late homework will not be accepted in this course. So please make sure you manage your time appropriately. So that's 11.59 and 59 seconds on the 1st of September, which is a week uh, from Tuesday, uh, the 25th, first day of classes. Okay. And so what are the goals of this course? My goals are to give you a rigorous introduction, stress on rigorous, uh, to operating systems. I won't be teaching you, per se, the internals of a specific operating system, but I'll be giving you an engineering treatment so that you can look at a particular operating system implementation and understand what design choices the creators of that operating system has made for certain things like the way they do page management, the way they do memory management, the way they do process management, and so forth. And so um, I will develop your comprehension of OS design and implementation issues. Because essentially, the capabilities associated with a particular operating system is really just the sum total of all the individual design decisions made uh, for various components and what behaviors that gives rise to as those components interact to provide all of the services uh, brought forth by an operating system. I will cover key concepts that are important to know for operating systems. And I'd like to try to apply 
this learning to an actual working system. Um, I'll probably have you write some code in C or C++ uh, so that you have access to the underlying facilities for things like threading. Um, but if time permits, uh, I'm not sure how we're going to pull this off. Um, ideally, I'd like to try to see if we can experiment with a toy operating system or at least uh, do a case study of the internals of a specific operating system. And so the idea in addition to this is to hone your critical thinking skills using case study and analysis, uh, thinking about the capabilities associated with an operating system given certain design decisions for the major components uh, which collectively give you that operating system. And so how am I going to measure this? Uh, requirements, we're going to have uh, four programming assignments, collectively worth 25% of the grade, four homework assignments, collectively worth 25% of the grade, uh, two written exams, collectively worth 25% of the grade. Now, if you look at this, you'll notice it's equally distributed points-wise across various types of assessment components. And so I recognize that maybe you're a nervous test taker, um, but you do better on the homeworks and the programming assignments, so I try to make it as uniform as possible across the various types of assessments. And so this class will also, for the final exam, we'll have a final project that's worth 15% of the grade, uh, and that will require a PowerPoint or slide presentation or presentation. And lastly, class participation will be 5%. And so addressing the idea of group projects, uh, it's a note. Um, all of your projects will be individual efforts but, and this is a very, very important point, I do allow you to collaborate with your colleagues. Now, of course, collaboration can mean many things, and there's a fine line between collaboration and cheating. Now, when you collaborate, you can discuss ideas, you can discuss concepts, but when you produce your answers, you, your answers must demonstrate your own understanding of the material, meaning you cannot copy someone else's answer. It's painfully obvious when you do. It won't be fun for you, and it won't be fun for me. When you collaborate with someone and you pass in your work, you must cite the name of your collaboration partner as well as the extent of your collaboration. So, for example, if somebody helped you understand uh, what um, page frames are and what um, demand paging is, well, you cite the name of that person, Mary Jones, for example, helped me to understand the difference between uh, on-demand paging and how page frames relate to pages, then you cite that. But when you answer the question about a case study about performance issues associated with a particular paging implementation, you must be able to produce your own answer. And the key to success in my class is to start early, start early, start early. I can't say this enough. If you wait until the last minute, for example, uh, the day before, two days before, to download and look at the homework assignment and start it, that's a recipe for failure. You should be doing work every single day, regardless of if you have something due or not. It's very doable in bite-sized chunks, and I recommend you find a time and you find a space where you can get your work done. And I realize that many uh, are at home, some are at home, and some are on campus, but I do recommend uh, you engineer your schedule uh, to find a time and a place where you can be productive in getting your work done, in particular the reading material. Okay, submitting your work. For homeworks, uh, programs, projects, it's all electronic submission and the instructions will always be on the assignments. Unless stated otherwise, now stress that again, unless stated otherwise, all assignments are due at 11.59 and 59 seconds p.m., that's Eastern Standard Time, so East Coast Time, that's one second before midnight. It's on the due date listed, unless it's otherwise stated at a different time. So that's your default, 11.59 and 59 seconds p.m. Now, all your code, if it's a programming assignment, must compile and run. I'm not product support. Uh, if it doesn't compile, doesn't run out of the box, you get a zero without review. So please make sure that your work runs. I'm not going to sit there and debug your work. Um, when you submit documents, MS Word or PDF documents only. Do not submit rich text files. Do not submit pages. Do not submit open office. Do not submit star office. None of that. Two formats, Microsoft Word or PDF. Now, I will assign a zero, not even look at it. 
if it's not Microsoft Word, not PDF. Please exercise care in doing this. With privilege comes responsibility. You are responsible to make sure that you're submitting one of the two formats. Do not just submit whatever you want and think I'm going to grade it. This is not a surprise, so don't be surprised if you submit something other than Microsoft Word or PDF and get a zero. If you have images or figures, those images that you submit must be in Microsoft Word or PDF. Take the time to import that image into a document in either Microsoft Word or PDF and submit that document. Do not submit image files, only Microsoft Word and PDF. That's it. When you are asked to submit slides, PowerPoint slide format only. I do not have pages, nor do I care to use pages. If you submit your slides, you can always, most of these programs, save as PowerPoint. Make sure you follow the instructions on the assignment. If you have any questions whatsoever, please post your questions to Slack, and I will very quickly address uh, your question. Academic honesty. Do not pass off someone else's work as your own. Now, this includes copying programs. It includes copying answers either from your colleagues in the class or on the web. I'm well aware uh, that there are a lot of answers to questions floating around on the internet. I have tools that will go and search and find these things. So don't think that I'm not checking. I check every single thing passed in. Now, what happens when you're caught? Okay, well, you get a zero and possible failure in the course, and you will be referred uh, to the judiciary process, certainly to the chair, the dean, and the administrative process. It's not fun for you, it's not fun for me, and I have to say that every year I have this issue with at least one person, and I've been teaching since 2010. Always cite your references. If there's material, reference material that you find to help support your answers, and you use information, cite the reference. Never just copy. That is plagiarism. Use your own words and demonstrate your understanding of the material. Now, for certain components, I will be requiring you to sign an academic honesty pledge. Uh, that will be for the take-home written exams. Disruptions. Now, we are all remote, whether you're on campus uh, or not. Please make sure you switch off your cell phone or put it on silent alert. And when you're using your laptop, desktop, your technology, what have you, uh, to participate in class, do so only for class activities, like taking notes. Now, of course, if you're using you know, social media, gaming, web surfing, and things like that while attending class on the WebEx sessions, certainly that means you're not interested in what we're trying to do in class. So if this type of disruption becomes a problem, you will be kicked out of class and won't be allowed to participate in the synchronous sessions. Now, I consider this a disruption, and I take this quite seriously. Uh, collectively, all of your colleagues in the class have paid a lot of money uh, to be here. And I consider this a disruption, and I consider such disruptions as cheating your class out of that hard-earned money that they use to pay for these classes. So if you are disruptive and it becomes an issue, you'll be asked, to leave uh, the WebEx session, and I actually have the capability to kick you out. And if it becomes a real problem, every instance of a disruption will result in a two percentage point per incident, a two percentage point deduction on your final grade. So if you have five disruptions logged against you, that's 10 percentage points. That means instead of 100, you get a 90. Instead of an 80, you get a 70. I'm quite serious about this. Side conversations, yes, I can hear you. This is also a disruption, both to your colleagues as well as to me. So make sure you mute your microphones and make sure you're in an environment and a location where you can actually pay attention uh, to this class. Just because we're online, I expect you still to maintain the same standards as you would had we been in person. Tardiness. Simple policy, if you have any questions about this, go talk to Dr. Asomni, the chair. Come to class on time or not at all. When the class time starts, that's when I begin lecture. Make sure you're here before then. So that means organize yourself, keep a good schedule, and make sure you arrive before class begins. Manage your time. You're all adults. I treat you that way. If you need to leave, just exit. Don't come back. I can't deal with the disruption, and the disruption is also to your classmates. 
I'm quite serious about this. Course objectives. So what the objective is, is to describe the organization of computer systems, namely the operating system in particular, to look at all the various components, their designs, the design consideration that goes into each, and how their behavior gives rise to certain features, if you will, in the resulting system. So we'll tour all the major components of an operating system. Uh, we'll look at different types of computing environments, and then we'll also explore an existing operating system at a high level. So let's take a look. The material for chapter one. Well, first question I have to ask is what is an operating system? What do you think an operating system is? Now, some of you will think, okay, it's software. Um, it allows you to run programs, okay. Um, it abstracts or hides the details of the underlying hardware, okay. That's all very true. An operating system is nothing more than a fancy program. That's not too controversial. Everything that runs on the hardware is a program, it's software. So it's nothing more than a program, but this particular program has some unique features. It acts as an intermediary between the user of a system and the hardware on the system. So when you use your MacBook Pro, for example, you don't interact directly with the Intel processor running on it or the graphics card. You interact with Mac OS, and it's Mac OS that interacts with that hardware on your behalf. So you click the mouse, some routine in the operating system is triggered, and it collects your mouse click and its location on the screen. You press a key on your keyboard, uh, some routine in that intermediary program records your key click, and then it draws uh, the right letter of the alphabet on your screen. And so the operating system has a number of goals, and these high-level goals include execution of user programs, and make solving user problems easier. So they run user programs. And why is it important to run user programs? Well, there's more than one user program that you want to run at the same time. And so this execution of user programs is aware that more than one user program might want to run. And whenever you have more than one thing trying to use a single resource like your CPU, well, you have to arbitrate between them, i.e. share this underlying hardware. So the execution of the user program involves the sharing of this hardware among all the different programs that might want to use it. And then the solving of user problems making it easier, meaning that they have very clean interfaces or APIs that make it easy to interact with the underlying system. So you don't have to deal with memory addresses. Uh, you don't have to deal with bit sequences and control codes for printers and things like that. You just call a print function and the printer handles uh, the rest or the underlying operating system handles the rest. So it makes computer systems convenient to use. Okay, well, convenient means many different things. It could mean that you have prolonged battery life if you're looking at a mobile device. Convenience could mean that it's very responsive, so it's always asking for your input. It's very fast in doing so. It also allows you to use hardware in an efficient manner, right? So it tries to extract as much performance as you can out of the underlying hardware. And the operating system does all this for you. And so these goals, depending on the application, can be a little bit different. Depending on the form factor or the type of compute hardware, it can be different. Because certainly using a desktop and using a mobile device are very, very different. With a desktop, you're not as concerned about power consumption. But with a mobile device, you are concerned about power consumption, battery life. Okay. So let's take a look at the structure. A computer system can be divided into four high-level components. We have the hardware. We have the operating system, we have the application program, and then we have users that interface with these applications. So starting at the bottom, let's look at the hardware. So here in this diagram, if I cast your attention or draw your attention uh, to this gray box on the bottom, this is the physical electronic circuit. So these are the CPU, the chips, the memory, uh, the I.O. devices, things like your network card. Uh, I.O. devices take data off your computer or pull data onto your computer. And so all of this hardware uh, is singular. You don't have more than one set of memories. And now certainly some CPUs have more than one processor core, and we'll talk more about that. And your I.O. devices, you only have one network card. And so the goal of the operating system, the next component, is to control and coordinate the use of the hardware among various applications. 
So let's take into consideration something like a network card. You only have one of them. You could have four programs. Maybe you have uh, um, music streaming running. At the same time, you're engaging in instant messaging. At the same time, maybe you're booking some travel. And at the same time, uh, you have your, your video, web video turned on, right? They're all using the network card because they're reaching out from your computer uh, to get data off the network. Now, of course, you have one network card. How are you able to use that among those four applications? Well, that's the operating system doing its sharing or implementing its coordination and sharing uh, capabilities. So the operating system controls and coordinates the use of hardware among various applications uh, and users. Then we have application programs. Now, the application programs, they use system resources to solve computing problems for the user. So let's say you know you want to write a homework app, right? Well, you use Microsoft Word or some word processor. What does it do? It allows you to create beautiful documents, uh, format that text in various types of fonts, and then it spits it out to the computer, uh, to the printer for you, right? So that the, solves the problem of document preparation. You also have things like web browsers. Uh, it solves the problem of connecting to a server and drawing web pages. Uh, based on those server web page definitions uh, to implement some remote application. And so these applications solve problems. Maybe you want to calculate uh, uh, the returns on an investment or the payments that you might have for a mortgage uh, uh, or an automotive loan or a student loan, right? Well, what would you do? You get a spreadsheet, and that spreadsheet has formulas in it that allow you to actually calculate what the payments are given uh, the amount that's financed and the financing rate and the term of the financing. And so we have all sorts of applications, things like word processors, compilers, web browsers, database systems, and video games. But when we think beyond just a traditional computer, like a tablet, laptop, uh, server instance, um, uh, think of something like autonomous driving. Well, the ability to steer your car or stay in your lane as the autonomous driving is going, that's just an application, the steering application. And so what problem does it solve? It solves the problem of keeping the car in the center of the lane. And then it's called lane keeping. And then you have what's called localization and mapping, right? It constantly figures out where the car is as it's moving and updates its understanding uh, based on a map as well as all of the items that are around it as measured through its sensors. And so the application in that case solves the mapping problem and then the lane keeping application uh, solves the problem of keeping you in the center of your lane. Now then lastly on top you have the user of the application. These users can be people, they can be machines or other computers. Now certainly when you're using a word processor, you the human is the user, but there are other applications in autonomous driving uh, where maybe a car needs to know what the GPS coordinate is uh, on the map. So in that case, the car is the user and the GPS service ultimately uh, reachable through wireless or through GSM satellite, uh, through sat geosynchronous satellites. Uh, that's the, um, that's the, that's the uh, system being used. So you can have a machine or program be the user of another program, right? So web services are a prime example of that, or even a car, an autonomous driving, it needs an update on where it is. It, know where it knows where it's moved, so it just asks the GPS service, hey, what's my current GPS coordinates? Okay, so the users can be a number of different things, can be people, can be machines, or can be other computers or the processes that run on them. So let's look at a multi-user system. So here on a multi-user system, we have a computer hardware at the bottom. We have the operating system that masks over the computer hardware. And so the view of each of the application programs for your system uh, is of the operating system. They don't have access to the underlying hardware. Now, what that means is every time an application wants to use the underlying hardware, it has to do so through a system call or a service call made available by the operating system. And so in doing so, the operating system, it knows who and what and how many service calls have been made, and it also can now coordinate and share resources among all of the users of those service calls. 
So here we have a bunch of different system application programs. We have a compiler. A compiler takes a description of a process or program and it translates it into machine code that's understandable by the underlying uh, hardware uh, and sends it to the operating system that then executes it on the underlying hardware. We have an assembler, which is for assembly language. It's another low-level compute language. We have a text editor, something like Microsoft Word, or maybe something like a database system, right? So a database system, it stores and retrieves and queries data. So it's going to use the CPU, it's going to use your disk, and could also ultimately um, make a call over the network to a remote database. So we have all these different application programs, and now we have a bunch of users. So maybe you are running your compiler, uh, another user attached to the same system is using assembler, another text editor, another is using the database, whether directly or indirectly. Your indirect use of a database could be because you log on to a banking website, and then you're now trying to query what is your outstanding balance or how many checks you've written, and so forth. So we have these four different components, the hardware, the operating system, the system and application programs, and then we have the users. Now the system and application programs, you notice there are two types of application programs. They're both application programs, so one are applications written by arbitrary people, and the other are system programs. These system programs implement um, sophisticated things that use the hardware, like reading a file or writing a file. At the level of these system programs, when you read or write a file, for example, you don't have to uh, spin the disk, uh, get the disk spinning, and then you know check a certain sector and a certain uh, platter on your disk. You don't have to deal with those hardware details. All you do is you give it a name, and you give it an operation, and you give it data. Read this data from this file name. Write this data to that file name. And so these system applications are provided for you in a set of so-called API libraries that allow you to do certain functions on the operating system, uh, which indirectly allows you to interact with computer hardware. Okay, so what do operating systems do? Well, it depends on your perspective. As a user, what is a user concerned about? Well, it has to be easy, right? So graphical user interfaces are a prime example of this. It has to have good performance. You want things to be responsive. And so one interesting example of this is when you press on Siri on the Apple uh, iPhone product, uh, it's a voice interface. Now, certainly it works relatively fast, but the processing of your voice happens in two different places. The actual recording and digitization of your voice happens on the phone, but then once it has your voice, when it wants to analyze what your utterance means, it sends it off to a server where there's a lot more compute power and it sends back the results with data that it might have looked up. So users care about performance and this good performance might mean designing your application to decide what part is on the local device and what part might be on a more powerful system that it interacts with over the network. And so good performance users care about and they don't care about resource utilization, right? So when you're using your mobile phone, you don't care about resources. You care about how easy it is and how fast it is. And performance can also include power consumption. You don't want your batteries to run out in half an hour. You want your battery life uh, for your mobile device to last a day or more. But if you have a computer that's shared among a bunch of people, and this is from kind of the older days, like a mainframe or mini computer, you have to keep everybody happy. So let's assume you know, we had one compute server and you were all uh, going to use this server for various purposes, everyone has to be kept happy. So that means you have to try to balance all of the resource needs equally among all of the users. When you use a dedicated system such as a workstation, one computer per person, you have dedicated resources uh, that are on that workstation, but you frequently use shared resources from servers. So in that particular case, that's like you have your workstation and you're reaching out to a server, right? Whether it's a cloud-based storage like Dropbox or some other type of shared mechanism, compute services like maybe Amazon's Elastic Cloud Services. When you have handheld computers, those are generally resource poor. And the reason for that is when you have a small form factor, something that fits in the palm of your hand, well, you can't afford to put a lot of heavy processing in that and you can't afford to put a lot of batteries in that. 
So often these handheld computers like cell phones and other wearables are optimized for usability, ease of use, and battery life. Now, some computers have little to no user interfaces, and these are generally things uh, that are appliances. And appliances use what are called embedded systems. Usually, they're singularly purpose uh, computers. They're running a very simple operating system, and you see this all the time in devices and automobiles. For example, you can go to Lowe's or some such hardware uh, store, and you can buy internet or Wi-Fi connected uh, washers and dryers for laundry. Now, of course, you might ask, well, why should I need a Wi-Fi washer dryer? Maybe for some reason, you want to be able to sit in class um, and check on your laundry, or maybe you want to be able to start your laundry, all right? You load it up, and you want to be able to start your laundry um, while you are at lunch, for example, and check on its progress. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why people might want to do that, or perhaps maybe you have a system set up uh, with Amazon where once you have a certain number of washes, now there are some systems where it has a reservoir full of detergent, and when that reservoir gets to a certain level, um, you might want to kick off a new order, and on your doorstep two days later, you get more laundry detergent, right? How awesome is that? So such devices have little or no user interfaces, and they're embedded, uh, meaning they use a small processor inside the device, and they don't have interfaces or little interface at all, right? Um, they don't have a typical menus and, you know, windows and dialog boxes that you interact with like you would with something like a word processor. So operating systems do all sorts of things, but the things that they do and the things that are important really depends on your perspective, right? If you're shared, are you singularly purposed? Are you a device? Uh, or are you mobile? All sorts of considerations. So an operating system can be more than one thing, and it really depends. And that's the takeaway I want to stress here. It really depends on um, what the use pattern is, the usage model. So what is an operating system defined as? Well, it can be twofold. It can be a resource allocator, right? And so it manages all the resources, and it says, okay, application one, you get a little bit of resources, you get a little bit of resources, the other application gets some of the resources, and it decides whenever there's a conflicting request, so two applications at the same time want the same resource, it arbitrates. Uh, it decides which one should get that resource. And for these conflicting requests, it tries for efficient management and also fair usage of this resource. Now, certainly there are some times, and we'll talk about this in another sitting, but there are some times where you don't want fair usage, and I'll allude to that um, in another sitting. The operating system is also a control program. In that case, it controls the execution of programs to prevent errors and improper usage of the computer, i.e., it's coordinating the input and the output. So when you're a controller, you're saying, okay, this is the fashion in which you will use these underlying hardware resources. And doing so, it prevents, for example, two applications from trying to write the same file at the same time. How does it do that? Well, when we talk about interrupts and blocking interrupts, if someone's currently accessing a resource, it locks out others so they can't access that resource at the same time. Right, so why is that important? Suppose you're a server at a bank and you have one person who wants to withdraw money while the same person wants to deposit money. You can't have those happen at the same time because you'll get a conflict. And we'll talk about deadlock and locking as part of our further discussion on this idea of resource control. Okay, so there's no single definition as I said and everything that you get from a particular vendor like Microsoft's Windows or Apple's Mac OS, uh, Ubuntu Linux, and so forth, when you order a quote-unquote operating system, it fits the definition, right? Uh, it's very small, very feature complete, but the operating system is typically the so-called kernel that implements the basic services, but you also get a lot of other things like a graphical desktop, um, sophisticated file system, the ability to connect over the network, all sorts of things together uh, is often called a distribution, right? It's a particular choice of tools, utilities, in addition to the operating system itself. And so among all of these things you get from a vendor, what you call your quote-unquote operating system, there's one program that's resident in memory all the time, 
uh, it's running all the time on your computer, and it's called the kernel. And the kernel is what we will refer to when we talk about the operating system. The kernel implements all the basic necessary resources needed in, in order to share the underlying hardware. Everything else that's not the kernel is either a system program, it ships with the uh, operating system, or it's a so-called application program. And I think I lost my slide. Or it's, an, so, or it's an application program. It has a bunch of high-level services that are reusable and generally very useful. So when you start your computer, what happens? Well, the power, the circuits power on, and the operating system gets loaded. So whenever you cycle the power, be that power up or you reboot your machine, there's one key program called the bootstrap program. Now, this bootstrap program is typically burned into read-only memory or what's called electro electrically programmable read-only memory, known as firmware. Because that first program that loads your operating system, it has to be ready to run when you first turn it on. So when you first turn on your system, there is no operating system running. The bootstrap program runs, and that bootstrap program, after checking to make sure your memory is okay and your disk is okay and functioning, right, it then loads your operating system kernel and then executes your operating system kernel, and now your kernel has taken over execution from the bootstrap program or the bootloader, uh, and the operating system then shares the resources for the underlying hardware, including accepting system calls from libraries from the applications. And so this computer startup is handled by the bootstrap program or bootloader, uh, and a popular one in Linux is called Grub, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, further during the semester. And its job is to check the system state to see, make sure all the hardware is functioning correctly, and then to load the operating system. So let's take a look at the basic computer system organization. Now this is called the von Neumann architecture, and it kind of looks like the human body. You have a very high speed substrate, kind of like your spinal cord, and its job is to carry messages uh, back and forth between one high level component and the other. So we have here a CPU, or central processing unit, and the central processing unit you can think of as the brain of the computer. It executes the instructions. And you can have one CPU or multiple CPUs. Uh, multiple CPUs are a so-called multiprocessor system. Some CPUs on the CPU itself has more than one processor, and that's called multi-core. So you have a CPU, something called a device controller. A device controller is connected to the bus, and that device controller's job on the device side is to understand all of the control codes and electrical circuits you need in order to get the device to do something. On the CPU side, you write a command to the controller, and then it takes that command and knows how to interact with the device itself. And so you have these controllers, device controllers, uh, for disk. You have a USB controller for certain peripherals, like mouse, keyboard, and printer. You also have another controller for your network. Uh, you have your main memory. Your main memory is attached to the system bus, and it's used for intermediate storage of programs uh, that are executed by the CPU. So when you're running a program on the CPU, it's not running on the CPU, it's actually stored in memory, and the CPU is reading those instructions uh, from main memory. When you load a program, it's taken from disk, loaded across the disk, uh, across the, by the disk controller, and sent across the bus to memory where it stays resident, and the CPU then reads those instructions from memory. So we have the bus that connects all of your components, uh, and we have our controllers, and we have our CPU, and the concurrent execution of CPUs and devices, they're all competing uh, for cycles, right? So all these devices are competing uh, for time. And CPU is executing, while the disk controller is executing, USB control is executing, the graphics adapter is also executing and they all try to contend for access to this bus and access to whatever is in memory. So all of this coordination is handled by the operating system, which itself is just, at the end of the day, a program that sits resident in memory. Okay, so let's uh, end here, and we'll pick back up on Thursday uh, and continue on with our conversation. So please do make sure you look at homework one. It is due 
uh, a week from Tuesday. It was due on September 1st, Tuesday night at 11.59 and 59 seconds. I will see you then. Stay healthy and stay safe.